Yo, what's up, Sam? Hey, what's happening? How you doing, man? I'm good. Another day, another music business podcast, man. Um, today we have our first guest that's ever been on the podcast twice. Uh, we thought it was extremely relevant for her to get on it, get on the podcast. She does a lot of research um, regarding the music industry. She's a great writer. She's got some great essays. Sherry Ku. She's been on the podcast before. Um, for those who didn't hear that episode, it was a couple months ago. It was a great episode. We we got into insights and industry trends and that sort of stuff. And you know, while the the industry is changing, she's been doing a lot a lot of research on you know what this impact will look like, um, how artists, managers, and people alike can um, live stream their shows, um, and the research behind that. She put out an entire uh, sixteen page document. Uh, with resources on how to navigate the the uh, the quarantine if you're in music, whether that's you know subscribing to uh, South by Southwest, a couple of their video streams, or just how to stream yourself. Um, she's been a huge help for 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 indie artists, and you know that that 16 page document actually went semi viral on Twitter because people are just kind of like really hoping and really praying for <laughs> for additional insight into this into this time. So luckily we got her we got her on the podcast for an hour or so, and we get to talk through a lot of that ourselves. Um, Sam, what'd you think? Yeah, I thought it was incredible. I think obviously Sherry, incredible writer, written for Billboard, NPR Music. Rolling Stone, Resident Advisor, the list goes on and on. I think uh, she always has the undertone and is at the intersection of like music and tech. And I think given the fact that people aren't able to really tour or spend as much time with in person with their fans right now, technology, digital marketing, those, uh, this is of utmost importance to an artist's career. So I think this is a very timely time to have her back on, which is really kind of why we really wanted to have this conversation. So I think uh, we're not going to pretend like nothing's going on, but we are trying to bring you the news that's going to help you thrive amidst the chaos. So um, if you don't already, Sherry also has a really incredible newsletter, Water and Music. You can check it out and sign up at our website, sherryhu.com, C-H-E-R-I-E-H-U.com. Um, without any further ado, let's get into the show. Let's do it. Sherry, what's up? How are you? Happy, happy quarantining. <laughs> you too yeah i'm doing i'm doing well um thankfully I'm, I'm feeling pretty good health wise um nothing terrible has happened on that front and um yeah as we were talking about earlier i'm, I'm just starting to get into a work at home routine and like a fully remote work routine um which, which feels good but it's taken a while it's taken like a couple of weeks at this point oh yeah yeah for sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, what what was your workflow like before? Because you do a lot of freelance writing, and and obviously we all know how it's changed. You have to be in your mm. in your apartment, but um, what how has your workflow changed since everything started? Yeah, so yeah, I have been um, working remotely at least partially um, prior to this whole situation. Mm -hmm. um, I would work from home um, on some days, but uh, a lot of times I'd like have to meet people for coffee for an interview in New York, so. Um, I was just like, I was pretty flexible location wise. So I would find myself in Manhattan a lot, but I'm based in Brooklyn. So if I didn't have to travel, I would just stay home. Um, I've tried a bunch of different like co working uh, spaces and memberships in New York. And so, yeah, so I've been pretty flexible um, in terms of location previously. Whereas now it's like by necessity, I, I have to <laughs> yeah. stay at home. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. So I, I think uh, obviously, I think this is a very like timely conversation for us to have, given that due to in light of recent circumstances, there's been some obviously drastic changes to how everybody has to function with a big impact in the, the music industry that's so heavily relying on different touring, uh, that's relying on touring. So, I mean, from, from your perspective, um, just off the bat, let's start on like a, a positive and high note. Like, what, do you, what, do you, what have you found to be some of the, the most interesting and exciting changes that have been made by different artists and different companies in the music industry as a response to quarantining? Yeah. Um, thank you for asking that because we could all use some more positive. Yeah, 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 <laughs> thank you. Sure. More positive mindset in this climate for sure. Yeah. I, I personally have been um, super inspired just by the resilience of so many artists and their kind of immediate jumping towards engaging with both with each other and with fans and online environment in super interesting ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so of course, like artists are in a very vulnerable position in this context, but like many more of them are um, just deciding to, I guess, open up their creative processes to the public, for instance, like 
so many artists, especially in, I would say, the electronic and hip-hop world, are going to platforms like Twitch um, and just, like, saying, hey, I'm, I'm stuck at home producing music. I'm working on this new album. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I might as well make the most of it. And uh, you, like, broadcast it uh, to the world, to fans, maybe incorporate fans in the in my own creative process. Um, mm. That's something that hadn't really happened before. And, um, yeah, I personally am very inspired by that, just, like, how um open and transparent and like fluid a lot of um this like artist interaction and communication is um i we we, we can talk more in like in more detail about live streaming but i have seen a lot of really great live stream shows and interestingly the the live streams i've enjoyed the most um felt the least like performances mm. um and they felt just like everyday conversation um, you know, just like as if, I mean, uh, even like these biggest celebrities, like my first live stream show I saw, I think was John Legend. Um, he mm-hmm. did a live stream at Global Citizen. It was just like a half hour set. And it was literally just him and his phone on IG Live. Um, it, it, and he was just playing the piano and his wife, you know, showed up with a glass of wine. I was just sitting next to him and it felt very casual and mm-hmm. low key right. um, in a way that you just would otherwise never um, get from celebrities of this caliber. And yeah, the, the ones that I, the other ones that I enjoyed, the most felt much more conversational and much more intimate in that sense. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that um, those connections are happening even more in spite of people not getting together in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've also seen um, artists collaborate that I have never seen collaborate or even mm-hmm. interact um, with each other before. Like these DJ battles that I'm seeing on IG live. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, like, I had literally had a, a group of friends that were live streaming but they, they, we were all in Zoom watching Lil John battle T Pain at the same time. That is time. amazing. <laughs> I was like, I was like, man, this is this is a crate. This is awesome, though. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was, and I was just talking with someone about. Um, so, do you know the app House Party? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a mobile video chatting app. Um, we were talking about how there, it would be cool to have like a house party for watching live streams. Like, I don't think that product exists yet, but like some kind of app where you can like come together and like watch a live stream i like i think there's a chrome extension where you can do this with netflix it's called like netflix party where you can all like get oh, together I, and yeah, like yeah, yeah. before oh yeah okay yeah um, yeah well not not before but this yeah, it's but just, it's, yeah. in terms of like a new behavior okay yeah um but in terms of a new behavior um coming up in this moment yeah it's just so interesting like i i would not previously have anticipated to like make a social event or like right. kind of like a virtual social gathering around some of these battles. But yeah, it totally makes sense. Do you think that some of the things that we're seeing now will stick? Like when you see some of the things mm. like the IG uh, stream via, from uh, John Legend and his wife, do you think, uh, well, Chrissy Teigen, but mm-hmm, do, you, mm-hmm. do you think some of these things will stick even after quarantine's over? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. <sighs> okay, I personally have a hard time believing that these kind of like IG battles <laughs> we'll continue long term. I, I think there's just like such a void in that kind of like super exciting entertainment right now that right. Uh, yeah like that's like one of the first formats that I guess a lot of artists turn to um what, what, what's interesting is that a ton of artists in the past had already been using um IG live just to chat with fans already um mm-hmm. like not all artists but um I mean what, like one extreme case I think Megan Thee Stallion um broke the news about like her latest record label contract woes on IG live. And like a lot of <laughs> artists had like used that channel for, for that reason to like break news in a very like casual ad hoc kind of way. Um, so that has been already going on for, for as long as IG live has been around. Um, I, I, I do see a lot more artists deliberately um, incorporating it on a, like a, on a strategic level in terms of like rolling out an album, um, mm-hmm. doing a live stream, like before an in-person show or like before a tour starts, like that doesn't happen that much. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of those experiences come up as like a core part of the fan experience. Whereas um, a lot of the times it's just seen as either like a one-off thing or um, like a marketing vehicle to drive um, sales of like brick and mortar um, show tickets or something like mm, what right. what is a really cool really compelling fan experience look like just in the form of a live stream like nothing else attached to it mm-hmm. i think there's like a ton of experimentation around that now and um yeah and i think the more people learn from this period the more they'll, they'll take with them the, the, with themselves long term yeah, yeah for right. sure 
It was interesting. We were doing a live stream with one of the, the DJs we work with. Her name is Blondish. And one of the fans mm. had a clever comment, which is, we have to be appreciative that for the first time in history, it's been acceptable to ask a DJ a question during their performance. <laughs> and I, and I, 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 I found so it interesting because I think it hits on one of the unique values of live streaming that I, I do think of anything the, the whole quarantine and, and COVID right now is really just a catalyst is that it enables this like direct artist to fan connection mm -hmm. uh, at scale in a different way. If, if an artist is actively like reading and engaging with comments and, and whatnot, it enables the, it's not just like a megaphone of like, Hey, like here's my music, mm -hmm. but it really is this kind of conversational aspect. Um, yeah. Have you? Have, what other interesting like formats? Because I, I do think it. We, everybody quickly flocked to, to live streaming, mm. um, and now they're happening all the time, which I think is incredible and a, a great way for artists to engage and connect with their fans. But when it comes to coming up with interesting ways to just break the molds, not what have what's been the most compelling to you? Yeah, um, I'm just thinking of like yeah, the kinds of live streams that I've seen so far. Um, yeah, so obviously there's like, there are a lot of artists who are doing DJ sets on live streams or just like performing sets, mm -hmm. often very stripped down sets of what they were going to play on tour or like their latest album. Um, that's like quite standard. Uh, and so if you look at the history of Twitch and the kinds of musicians that were active on the platform already prior to, um, prior to this whole COVID-19 situation, um, a lot of them had also been gamers, which totally makes sense to so, so, like why they would gravitate to Twitch. And so um, I'm also seeing more of that. I guess those aren't music specific, but they're musicians um, just like live streaming things that they're that they are interested in, whether it's like them themselves playing a game or like streaming themselves playing with another artist, you know, like mm -hmm. a certain game. Um, I'm definitely seeing that a lot more. And that's interesting because it kind of like blurs traditional boundaries of, I guess, like where an individual creator or streamer would lie. Like now you mm -hmm. can stream like all kinds of different things on a single right. account. Um, trying to think of what else. So this is not so much on the artist side, but there has been um, a huge flood, I think in a really good way of industry related programming online. So um, a couple of weeks ago, Troy Carter and, his company Q and A um, curated a really good series of industry panels, and um, he like really he got a really impressive lineup of speakers, like all the major um, like streaming curators, like mm. Carl Sherry, Tumabasa, um, across all the streaming services. There was one day with A and R, uh, like focus on A and R, and they had a lot of A and Rs from um, all the major labels. Um, one day they had, um, a lot of like artists and songwriters kind of talk about their own process. And, um, I just, I thought that was really great because, uh, I'm pretty sure like the panels were also scheduled within anywhere between like a day or a week, like in <laughs> advance, just like right, yeah. very much scrambling to get, um, like wh whoever would, would be willing or had the time to go on the panel. But, um, yeah, it was really, and like the, the panels were free, free to the public, open to anyone, um. And it was just really great to see all these people um, talking like quite openly and frankly with each other in a way that previously would be like paywall behind a conference ticket or mm. would like just not be accessible right. to the general public. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely seeing a lot more of that, especially from like industry conferences that were postponed um, mm. or canceled un understandably for, for the next couple months. Um, so I think now is also just a great time in terms of education. Like th there's so much that's being talked about um that's being live streamed and shared online that like previously had a pretty high price tag attached to it um which obviously is like maybe not as good for the conference organizers or event organizers maybe but mm -hmm. in terms of like openly sharing information that, that's a really good time for that well yeah, it also sure. depends on if they're you know what they're getting in return i think if people are getting email mm. addresses or you know some sort of subscription I, I i've seen i've seen a couple things who knows how you know moral this is or not, I guess it's your opinion, mm. but I've seen a couple of things say uh, it's free for a week um, and mm. then we'll charge you at the end of that week. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure they'll get a lot of people that sign up um, and then that forget to sign, to forget to, you know, unsubscribe at the end of that week. But, um, mm. mm -hmm. but I, I do think there are, you know, ways to exchange value without necessarily getting paid right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think now, um, yeah, I think now as everyone's stuck at home, 
the focus and the priorities on yeah, on education, on helping others, and um, especially of like fostering a sense of community. Um, I've been right. hearing like a lot more lately about the potential like long term psychological effects on people if they if they're forced to stay at home, um, not just for the next like couple of weeks, for the next like couple of months. Like that's a really long time, and um, yeah, I think that that's just like very important both on like a human level and also um, in terms of like these artists and um, companies that are looking to sustain themselves after this is all over. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think it's also um, pretty interesting seeing artists, like you were saying, share things that they've never shared before. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of artists can be, at least from working with artists in my experience, can be pretty closed off um, and then Mm -hmm. save the community building and things like that for live shows but live shows don't exist anymore. So if you don't, mm-hmm. if you don't, it's, it's, it's a little bit less of, is this an option in order for me to, you know, build my community or, you know, this is actually necessary for me to build my community at this point, you know? Mm. Um, so artists have had to put themselves, at least what I've seen so far in places and vulnerable places they've never been in before, because if they don't, they don't exist. <laughs> like everything, everything is on the internet right now, you know? So. Yeah, definitely. Um, Another thing that I've been thinking about, so like on, on that front, so yeah, absolutely. Um, some artists, and I think some artists are better suited for that kind of shift than others in terms of, yeah, like um, bearing themselves much more openly, becoming a lot more transparent. There's definitely like a steep learning curve or adjustment curve for a ton of artists. Um, something else that I learned in the past week for um, a piece that I'm working on around um, how like songwriters and producers are adjusting to the current climate is that. Um, previously, my, like from, from my understanding, a lot of like songwriters or producers could kind of lean on other people, um, often like in person in the studio to handle things like engineering, um, to handle things like mixing and mastering. Um, there's always like this assumption that you could like go to like your go-to person and kind of like finish your project in that way. Um, right. but now like all kinds of artists by necessity have have to be like totally self-sufficient like they have to be able to make a good recording um in in their own home when they previously didn't have to do that they they just had to come with a very specialized skill whereas Mm -hmm. now um yeah i've like talked with a bunch of uh producers who like either had to like get a lot of their own equipment that that they didn't really have before at home um like in in their actual home or like songwriters are like taking up you know, like are trying to teach themselves mastering and mixing skills that they didn't have to know before. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, right. Yeah, which I think, yeah, I, I'd like to think will be helpful long-term as well. Like, I don't think it hurts to be able to have more skills under your belt. But yeah, again, that's like a very steep and very sudden learning curve for a lot of these right. artists. Right, yeah. right. Um, a lot of people in the industry right now, you know, obviously the, the industry is a a very in-person sort of type industry. Mm. You know, I see, I see, I have friends that are software engineers and their, their workflow during the day has like barely changed. Um, what <laughs> yeah. do you think, what do you think the music industry will take away from this? And how do you think some different sectors will safeguard for the future? Um, because this is going to be traumatizing, I think for a lot of, a lot of companies and a lot of people within the industry. Um, and I know that's sort of a broad question because obviously there's licensing, there's live and it, they're all being affected in different ways. Um, but what are, what are some like things that you think, you know, in any of those sectors will, will be, uh, I guess, emphasized or or brought more to light throughout, throughout this and after this is over? Yeah. Um, there are a handful of different areas I can think of. So, um, one, which I kind of touched upon a little bit earlier is, um, like concert promotion companies. Um, including from from the smallest promoters to the biggest promoters like Live Nation, AEG, um, really thinking uh, more about their online brand or their online presence as like a standalone experience is interesting Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to it just being like a marketing funnel for their like kind of core um, in-person brick and mortar show business. So I, I think there's a page on Live Nation's site right now that's um, call something like live from home or live at home. And they have like a calendar of like all the artists they work with who are putting on these kind of virtual shows from, from mm-hmm. home or from, from wherever they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely see that being like once, once they become accustomed to helping artists like organize these shows, I, I definitely see that um, continuing long-term um, m- maybe not at the current volume, 
edits in because it won't be as necessary, at least from like the artist's perspective. Um, but yeah, I guess just like taking live streaming more seriously, making it more available to more um, to more fans or for more artist shows. Of course, as yeah, as you said, there there are like lots of licensing issues around that. Um, mm-hmm. But I think people are even like trying to find solutions around even around that side of things that like previously were not considered or were not prioritized at least. Um, so there's right. that. Um, th- th- this actually came up during um, the Troy Carter Q and A panel about both streaming curation and um, A&R as well. Um, Yeah, I feel like so much, especially of the recorded music side of the industry, especially in terms of how like promotion works and relationship building relies so much on in-person meetings. Um, Interestingly, even on the streaming side, like there is very much a culture of like going to the Spotify offices, going to the Apple music offices and like playing your music in person, um, which is basically the, the outcome is not the same as terrestrial radio but that behavior is very similar. It's like, mm-hmm. you might as well be like going into a terrestrial radio station and like pitching the main DJ there. So, right, right. yeah. Whereas now, um, and, and also because most of those curators are in um, major music cities, quote unquote, like New York, LA, um, Nashville, Atlanta, increasingly, um, there are only certain people who could afford to go there or who had access to like those kinds of opportunities by nature of just being close to there geographically. Whereas now I, I think it's like totally like that, that barrier to access to op- those opportunities is, has been broken down somewhat. And maybe that's just me, be, like me being more optimistic, but I do think like, um, yeah, it is a good thing for artists who might not otherwise get heard that they don't have to like squeeze themselves, squeeze themselves into like a meeting slot in <laughs> a streaming curators, like already right. super packed and like frazzled schedule. Um, yeah, so I, I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the early results of that are, but I think we'll see in the coming weeks. And I do hope to see, um, yeah, like artists who might not have otherwise been considered, um, in or like curation or A&R kind of context coming, um, coming up to the forefront. Mm, right. Right. Yeah. When it, I mean, going back to live before we can't talk about live anymore because you've talked about everything <laughs> we can about live. Uh, when it comes to like monetization of lives, I mean, I, I know there's some, uh, I know in the the virtual event, music events directory you put out and published, which was incredible. And I think definitely made tons of waves throughout the music industry. Um, you Thank mentioned you. a couple of different ways to, in which artists can have like paywalled, like live stream performances. Uh, have you seen that? I mean, I know what's been a little more popular has really been a, kind of uh, fundraisers and, and doing live streams for charity. I mean, when it comes to artists monetizing lives, do you, do you think that something fans will become accustomed to and, and conditioned to pay for? Uh, I, so as of right now, I think um, they are not. And it's, it's so interesting. It's, it's kind of like a chicken or egg issue mm-hmm. um, because yeah, on one side, I think fans are, not used to paying for live streams. Um, they're definitely used to paying for um, the amazing experience around an in-person show. Whereas like with a live stream, um, there, there's, there hasn't been that much, um, I guess, live musical content online that's elicited the same emotions of like being, um, being on the ground in a crowd mm-hmm. of strangers, like all like listening to and loving like, yeah. the, the same artist there've been very, very few experiences that like come to match that. Um, but then on the, on the other hand, most of the artists um, who are going to live streaming right now are going to the platforms that where you can make a live stream available for free. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think, so that's like a supply issue. And I think understandably that, 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 that is because artists are just looking to reach as many people as possible. They don't, they don't really want to hold any fans back from experiencing their music or their show. Um, mm-hmm. In, in general, I think it's, yeah, I think it's sensible to prioritize accessibility right now. So a lot of artists don't necessarily want to charge for a live stream. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been a couple of exceptions. So I think Erica Badu just hosted um, a live stream show for just $2 with this company called Maestro, um, which is not an open platform. I think they're like a kind of closed services oriented kind of mm-hmm. company. So they only work with a select number of mm. um, some artist clients, but mostly like bigger festival or promoter right. clients. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so, yeah, so that model, I'm not really sure how, um, how that will scale. That's, that's just kind of like a digital um, promoter business, essentially. Mm-hmm. Whereas like something like Twitch, like any, any one of us could like start streaming from our phone immediately. It's like a very right. different kind of dynamic, but maybe more difficult to monetize as mm-hmm. a result of that. Um, on, on platforms like Twitch, there is an option for fans either to subscribe directly to the artist's channel for like a monthly fee or mm-hmm. to donate um, bits, which I guess, yeah, could, could be considered Twitch's uh, kind of native virtual currency. So mm-hmm. you can like purchase bits as a fan and then give them to the artist. You can then like, cash them out mm-hmm. um, for, for mm-hmm. real money. Um, I know a lot of gamers, like full-time gamers on Twitch make most of their money from bits um, donated to them in real time, like during mm-hmm. their stream. So the model is proven in the gaming world, but not so much in the music world. Um, I, I guess in part because watching someone play a game versus perform a set, it's just like a very different kind of experience. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like a different level of interactivity. For sure. Um, I think so. Yeah. Have there been any other interesting... Uh, I mean, the undertone has just been like music industries hemorrhaging money outside <laughs> of monetizing live streams. Are there, right, right. Are there other interesting paths you've seen artists uh go down in order to to monetize and generate income whereas some of the more traditional revenue streams are not not streaming right now yeah 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 um there's i I think all of them are still emerging and unfortunately at least in the short term i i don't think it'll make up for lost touring revenue i mean it's like the the magnitude of that revenue is like hundreds of millions of dollars so yeah, yeah really hard to make that up um I, I think what a lot of artists and their teams are thinking about right now is how to um, generate the same or like a similar or close amount of recurring revenue um, online in a way that's like higher margin than streaming. Cause like streaming for mm-hmm. many artists is just like, it's like fractions of pennies per stream. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you still have to achieve a certain level of scale to like mm-hmm. make a living off of that. Um, so in terms of recurring revenue, I know paid memberships are becoming um, a lot more popular in general, or a lot of artists are looking into um, that model, whereas previously they didn't really prioritize it. They're just thinking about like streaming and touring or just like free social media. Um, But I know, I think Patreon published a blog post on their site from their head of data science saying they had like uh, over 30,000 signups um, on the creator side within just Mm. um, a couple of weeks. And so, yeah. So, and not only that, I guess you would expect the, the 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 churn rate from like the supporter side to increase in this time because a lot of people like are laid off or they just can't work. Um, mm-hmm. The economy mm-hmm. in general has gone down significantly. Um, but at least according to Patreon, the number of signups has um, like significantly outpaced the the churn, and so um, which is good for like Patreon as well as it's great for artists. Like people are still in um, in a mindset to support artists directly in this time which is mm-hmm. great. So, so there's paid memberships. There's um, a lot more artists are looking into like online education platforms, interestingly, um, like how they can sell um, lessons either like on a one-on-one basis or um, use a lot of online education platforms that are out there to create even just like a short course about um, music production or around using yeah. Ableton or whatever other dot. Um, sure. I, know, I know there's, there's a lot more interest in that as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think um I know one thing that's been popular has been uh artists I mean we having like virtual dance parties. I wonder if there's ever gonna be a, a time when people can like do ticketed uh ticketed events. We're just, yeah, just I was brainstorming actually brainstorming right now. That. Yeah. But I think the um at least in my opinion, as a as a music fan, the one thing that I love about live shows and about parties and sort of like things like that. Um, in-person experiences is actually the audio itself. So, um, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. bandwidth and being able to actually live stream a show and have it sound like you're in the room, I think is is really going to make or break those experiences. Um, I think that's one of the downfalls about like IG Live and people doing shows on Mm. IG Live. I think that sounds, you know, that's obviously great and you do feel like you are having an experience, but like imagine that experience coming out of your speakers, you know, Um, and it's sounding still like you're in the middle of that experience, like you're listening to a live album almost, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, there there are, yeah. I mean, technically you can get good sounds. I think most people 
aren't doing it I mean, for Instagram. Like you can buy this thing called like an iRig where you can essentially feed like pro audio mm-hmm. into mm-hmm. an iPhone. But I do think that most of the times it's not. And also per your point, Jordan, I mean, even outside of like that, if an artist does have that, like the average fan sound system is nowhere near the experience you're accustomed to at, at various right. venues. Yeah. Like right. if you're listening through a uh, random he- headset, like AirPods or something, yeah. it's like that. It's not going to be the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, and it's going to be you just different. trashed also. AirPods on on the music business. <laughs> <laughs> I own, I own, I own hair. <laughs> I own a pair, so I speak from experience. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, um, d- sorry, what were you going to say? I was just going to um, add quickly that this is partially a reason why um, I think like VR headset sales have improved in this climate. Um, which it like predictions could have gone either way. Like they're super expensive and not accessible. And so who would buy them? But I think as people are stuck at home, um, they want like truly interesting and like truly immersive content, almost as like a form of of escapism. Um, So it totally makes sense that uh, like, I think Facebook's Oculus headset um, was like sold out for a couple of weeks. Um, There's just like a lot of demand in, um, at least like they're more affordable headsets, which are like a couple hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that I thinking about like VR specifically, that was one of the industry's number one barriers was just mm-hmm. having like, uh, reaching people who actually own these headsets in the first place. Um, so I think the long-term effects, um, of that shift on the VR industry and the ability for the music industry and other like, uh, forms of entertainment to take part in that will, will be, will be a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's like forced adoption almost. It's like it's like what, people kind of, need, yeah. need it in order to be entertained. For yeah. for artists to host VR shows, I mean, like, what's the the barriers you have to overcome in order to do that right now? I know so there's been a, a couple like high profile shows, um, like Marshmallow. I mean, what what are mm. like if a random artist did want to venture into the space of like VR and hosting a VR experience? Is it possible for them right now without a massive budget? Mm. Um, it's really difficult, uh, in my mind to do that without the proper creative team. Mm. Um, so, so if you look at, uh, so you mentioned Marshmallow, were you talking about, um, like the, the Fortnite show or more recent show? Uh, was it, was the Fortnite show in virtual reality? I'm not even a hundred percent sure. I don't think it was a virtual reality. I think it was just available in the game. Right. Um, okay. Fortnite itself. But just to start with that as an example. Um, it was not virtual reality. It was like 2D. It was just in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think to capture Marshmallow in real time, he had to wear like a full body motion capture suit. And mm-hmm. there were like dozens of cameras around him in the studio, like, uh, I guess, tracking all his movements. Right. Obviously, a lot of artists like will not have access to that. 99% yeah, totally. of artists <laughs> have access to that, like at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then one of the companies that's been doing a lot of really cool uh, VR and like 3D and, and 2D um shows with artist avatars as well it's called the wave um mm-hmm. the wave xr is full name of the company um they worked with t- t- tanashi um with uh with imogen heap Lindsay sterling um like a lot of mostly electronic artists to date but they're definitely um expanding into other genres um but they have a whole team of in-house VR designers that design like the stage around the artist over the mm. course of a couple mm. of weeks. Um, right. So it's, yeah. And it's like, it, the, the end result is amazing. And I think it's why, um, I think it's why they've like continued. I, I know like they've had a ton of inbound reach recently um, in terms of, sorry, inbound. Yeah. Uh, inbound interest from the music industry in terms of like wanting to host more of these concerts, but it really is very like hands-on time intensive. Um, kind of ordeal it's, it's definitely not like twitch where artists can just kind of like sign up and put on their own show um, yeah I, I do think there are a lot of um I, I like to think there are a lot of like game developers or vr developers in the world right now that are like looking for work or will be interested in collaborating with an artist on on this kind of project mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not I, yeah i get i'm not really sure like what the best way to discover those developers would be i guess just like searching online um on like Twitter and Instagram and, and, and those kinds of social platforms. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, I think the supply of like talent is there, but I think it definitely requires um, one-on-one more direct collaboration 
over a longer period of time for now. Right. That makes yeah. sense. Um, do you think that, I mean, I have, um, I was video chatting with a friend um, who was laid off a couple days ago and mm-hmm. he was saying that he's going to apply for remote positions now just because he can see, you know, he's so like scarred from this whole experience that he'll, he'll only apply to jobs that he knows he'll have no matter what. Um, do you oh, see wow. that sort of shift happening in the music industry? So I know you wrote an article about um, re- the normalization of remote work and mm-hmm. you talked about how digital and PR um, could, you know, stand to survive this, maybe even benefit from it. Music licensors, supervisors, they may benefit from it. Do you think we'll see a shift in people actually choosing those industries or do you think that the, this won't mm. be enough to actually move people into those fields? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think in, in general, there is um, there's like a wider realization that uh, you really need to know like where your audience is or where your fans are online. Not that not that that wasn't necessary knowledge before, but now it's like more important than ever because that's the only place where you can really reach them. Um, and so, yeah, I think there'll be an interest in lots of digital marketing um, agencies and tools in general. Um, and so I think, and hopefully this will lead uh, to a lot, a lot more people becoming aware of um, just like the scope of what tools are available, uh, mm-hmm. how they can, you know, uh, yeah, how they can uh, analyze and reach their audiences more effectively. So I think that will, I, I don't know if that will change. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it may have a short term impact on employment and that, um, yeah, in, in that like talent agencies are probably not hiring right now, but um, right. a lot right. of like a, lo- a lot of marketing agencies. Um, are definitely like I know of a lot it kind of goes both ways some agencies um, their clients might might be like festivals or something that have been canceled but um, a lot of the agencies I've talked to have like are actually busier now than ever because they're trying to create um, tons of different campaigns for yeah a lot of um, artists and music companies who are in this kind of unexpected situation so um, yeah I can definitely see people uh, maybe I don't know on like a full-time basis but at least I'm like contract or independent basis like moving towards those circles yeah right sam i, you guess, can I guess, speak on that a little bit i right? can attest to that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i have been sleeping <laughs> uh, yeah i mean this is the i mean artists uh, connecting with fans is the foundation of an artist's career and if they yes. can't connect with fans in person then digitally is the the mechanism to do that, and that's the the, the lifeblood to any future success they'll have. So um, we've been helping artists do nonstop live streams. Uh, Saturday, which used to be a relaxed day for me, has become a <laughs> day that all my artists want to do a live stream. But it, no, it, we, we get good turnout, and it's been going really well. So I've been really really excited and happy about that. I think um, it's also too. I think art, like the smart artists. Uh, like now that they have more downtime, they should be investing that downtime towards being more proactive on the digital front, whether it's mm. they have an agency or it's just an artist on their own, right? If you're not gonna be able mm-hmm. to go perform or it's, uh, spend more time coming up with content, allocate more creative ideas and create a bandwidth towards how you want to engage and grow your audience online. I think, um, I mean, I've seen that happen with artists we're not working with. I've seen some of the artists that we are working with be- become just so much more actively and engaged. Like, uh, mentioned that artist Blondish again, but she's we're working on a show concept that's kind of called Saturday Night Fever, and it's there will be like mm. guests can call in, there'll be the mm. dance party, it'll all awesome. be streamed on Twitch, um, using a bunch of random Twitch features. So I think it's um like her level of interest and proactiveness around various digital campaigns is definitely spiked right now as well. So I think it's uh mm. it's definitely an interesting time because I do you think a lot of the net revenue in the music industry has gone down, but I think a lot of yeah. the focus um, and the importance of digital is, is the most important thing right now. Yeah. Um, I kind of have a question for both of you, I guess just off the back of that. Um, do you think that after this too many things will have shifted towards digital? Um, I'm, I'm imagining like hmm. myself when I'm, 65 years old and I have friends that are like, oh, I remember when we used to go to concerts in real life. <laughs> like, like, do, oh, you, no. think that, oh, do you think that, you know, after things like this, some experiences, uh, you know, may be diluted? 
I don't. Sam, do you want to go first? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure, I'll go first. I don't. No, I think uh, I think there'll be certain things that do live on after this. I do think this is a big catalyst in artists learning how to embrace lives, which I do think is a valuable way to go about engaging with fans without any sort of geographical con- constraints. So I think that's that will stick around. But I think uh, at anything, like people, this, this, this scarcity of like IRL in-person events if anything is just going to increase the appreciation, I think as our mm-hmm. life gets grow- more, more and more digital, like we've already seen trends prior to quarantine of people just the d- average daily consumption across digital devices skyrocketing. I think music and, and musical experiences and concerts have continued to be one of these amazing outlets to get away from that. And I, I don't think that's going anywhere. Mm. I think people will, will cherish it even more. Like I, I think people are already joking around about what that, that first weekend is going to be like when this is all behind us. <laughs> right. Just like, uh, like going to the club every, yeah. 24-7. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I told my friends I'm going to like give them all bear hugs when I see them for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. Like hugging. Oh, what, yeah. what a concept. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I read a tweet yeah. the other day that said, um, the first thing I'm going to do when this is over is I'm going to sit in a restaurant and cry. <laughs> oh my god! I was like, I was, I was like oh yeah, that's real. Yeah, that's yeah, real. It's probably real. <laughs> yeah. You know, things that yeah. we used to take for granted, and I think, I think, you know, relationships that, especially if you're an artist, um, the relationship with your fans that you maybe have taken for granted until now, you know, um, and building that relationship with artists more and more, or, or, or artists with their fans more and more every day. I think people will just be, uh, you know, when the artists see their their fans come out to a show. Mm. You know, it'll it'll be mm. like, wow, you all you guys all came. This is huge. You guys all came out here for me. <laughs> like mm. it was almost like the artists for for many many years were used to it, but now it's like you know, the first time the artist has a show after a pandemic. I can't think of a a situation where they're more where they're more appreciative for fans actually coming out to see them and spending money to see them. Yeah, totally. Um, one, yeah. So I I agree, um, and that I think people will still continue to go out to shows. It's still unclear, though. I mean, I don't even know how this would work. In, in the state of New York, for instance, there's like um, uh, like the, the, the governor, Governor Cuomo, kind of, I guess, instated a ban on gatherings above a certain size. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually not sure, like, how, is it just like an announcement on a certain day that just like totally switches that? Like, oh, now all concerts are allowed. Or is it yeah. like... A general rollout. <laughs> that is still. <laughs> I think, it, uh, to be honest, I think I think concerts and music festivals will actually be one of like the last things to mm-hmm. be yeah. brought back. I think yeah. once people can actually like might start opening restaurants, not uh, not essential businesses will be back in business. But yeah, I mm-hmm. think the the mass gatherings will be take the longest time. And it also mm-hmm. gets interesting to think about too, because then it's like historically in like pandemics there tends to be, you kind of quote unquote, like flatten the curve. But then after, right. there often tends to be like a little resurgence, like yeah. after everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. goes back to living normal life. So I, I think that it's the time in which I, yeah, I, I, I'm s- skeptical of everything, but I would not be surprised if it's like, we're, we're not like festivals aren't on until like, uh, the beginning of the year 2021. Or like, yeah, I, I don't, uh, I don't think that's, out of the question yeah. at all, which is kind of weird to think about given that so many of these events have been postponed to October. Right. Uh, yeah. It's just, just buying that, time. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, but yeah, so in like long, long term, eventually I think concerts will still yeah, have value yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other trend that I'm like, still trying to wrap, wrap my head around that I think is really interesting is what on, um, music streaming platforms is like going down versus up. So mm. like there've been various reports that in the aggregate, both music and podcast listening have gone down over the past couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are certain uh, areas of music, like, like chill playlists or like news podcasts or like kids music, um, kids music and podcasts that have like all gone up, at least according to Spotify and Deezer who have, mm-hmm. I think are the only streaming services who have like released official statements about, about these mm. changes. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't think this was unknown to a lot of people in the industry, but it was just like really grappling with the fact that so much of how music streaming, um, is, is marketed and, um, like has grown was by being a very lean back kind of service or like Mm -hmm. lean back, um, 
assuming a very on the go kind of lifestyle. Um, it, it was kind of like the soundtrack for people's commute, um, right. for people's like time in the office. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and like I, so many like artists and labels who don't even like necessarily have to do with like a commute playlist or like an office playlist. Yeah. I've seen their streaming go down. And so mm-hmm. um, I think, and I think this totally relates to artists looking at other kinds of online channels and revenue mm-hmm. sources as well in terms of, I guess, in terms of asking the question of, is it like, is it really a good idea to pour all of my time and energy into this ultimately very lean back kind of experience? Mm-hmm. Um, of course it's super valuable for reaching people, but um how can I kind of expand what I'm doing across mm-hmm. other channels? So, um, yeah. So I hope I hope to see more of that conversation. Yeah, right, sure. right. Yeah. That's super interesting. Yeah, I um, you know, Burke personally, I would, I think I've been listening to music a little bit less, also. Mm-hmm. Um, and personally, I think it's mainly because I listen to music as to kind of be like the backdrop to my life. So, you know, when I'm mm. at the gym, I have my gym playlist. When I'm, you mm-hmm. know, having a party and I have people over, I have my party playlist. And just the the, the scenarios in which I listen to different music is has all been one experience which is just me in my house you know Mm, yeah the experience that i want the experience that i have the experiences that i have are like less varied so Mm, like i don't necessarily like i was listening to pop smoke in the shower earlier today and i was like all right this is this doesn't this doesn't really make sense (laughs) like like, this this doesn't this doesn't feel this doesn't feel like a thing i want to listen to in the shower you know as opposed to like if i was at the gym maybe i would have listened to pop smoke you know what Mm. i mean or Mm. um so the ranges of experiences are a lot are a lot less um Mm -hmm. it's 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 funny you know some of my favorite tv shows i'm not watching as much um but yeah Mm. i do think i do think you know asking people and seeing what they say uh regarding that i think i think we'll we'll get a lot of interesting things just like hearing what people people's opinions are about that because i personally was one of the people that was like streaming is going to be fine <laughs> like yeah, streaming, me too. Every- i thought it was going to go up a lot yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was total opposite yeah right right mm-hmm. um but yeah definitely definitely interesting phenomenon for sure mm. um what have you personally been listening to recently mm. Oh gosh! Feel free uh, to like pull up your Spotify because when people <laughs> ask me that question, I was I like, might, I, I can oh barely God. remember my last oh the last song okay. I listened to. <laughs> Story of my life. Oh gosh! No, okay. I remember um, some things I recently listened to. So Thundercats, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. album just came out. It is what it is. Amazing album. Um, Knowledge, the producer, um, served a lot with like Anderson Pack mm, and a lot of other mm. artists. Um, his album came out and damn, um, it's really out. good. And so. Interestingly, I'm, I guess, like a very uh, not representative case study, but I have been listening to a lot more like lo-fi, hip-hop, like chill. <laughs> Me too, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Me it's, too. A, it's a super <laughs> effective, it's like a bomb, like a mental bomb to like get you in the zone. Um, to like, it's a very like calming backdrop. Um, and so I like Knowledge's latest album. Um, oh gosh, I'm pulling up the name right now, but it's like, it's it's a very like, quirky i mean he he's been making like lo-fi or lo-fi adjacent type mm-hmm. beats for a really long time and so um as always this album is like a very quirky take on that so kind of like wakes you up to like what's yeah, actually yeah. music which is great That's um awesome. let's see i also so in general i've been listening to um a little less music than usual um but i've been I actually have been watching more netflix i've been playing a lot more video games and i'm like nice. mm-hmm. going more into some video game soundtracks Um, This is going to be like maybe a deep cut, but there's a Japanese (laughs) game called Katamari. Okay. You know this? I'm not familiar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's like you're trying to like roll. I've only played a little bit of it actually so far, but it's like you're rolling like a a die around and like try to pick up stuff off off the floor. Mm. Yeah. My Um, girlfriend has that game on her Switch. Oh, really? Yep. Yep. On Switch. Yep. Um, But uh, yeah, but the, the soundtrack is like, extremely like Japanese pop, like very jazzy, very upbeat. Um, so that's just like stuck in my head and I listen to it a lot <laughs> <laughs> by, by nature of, of having played the game. So yeah. Right. Right. Nice. Fun. Um, so where can people find you sign up? I know you're constantly putting out tons of amazing content, keeping mm-hmm. the, the people informed. We're yeah, personally speaking grateful. Of Patreon. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So where can people find me? Uh, my website is just my name dot com sherry who c h e r i e h u dot com um on my website uh and also i think if you just google search 
Water and Music. You'll find a link to my newsletter. Um, it's called Water and Music. Um, there is an issue, a free, I guess, collection of original analysis, um, analyses on the music industry that comes out roughly once a week. But I also have uh, a paid membership on Patreon um, that's growing quite well. And um, through, through and through that page, I offer a, a bit more kind of exclusive um, research and like company databases from across the music industry. So people can, the intention with that is for people, I guess, to look, to get a look behind the scenes in my own research and writing process. And I'm also on Twitter um, at SherryHu42. Amazing. Awesome. Well, uh, always, always grateful to have you on. First repeat yeah. guest, I think, for, yes. for good for good reason at that, too. So uh, let's hope this is, uh, this is only the second and not the last. So there we there'll, go. Be, yes. there'll be more. There'll be more. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you thank again you. for having me. Yeah. Definitely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Yo, man, I thought that was a dope episode, dude. Um, always great having Sherry on. She's obviously one of the more knowledgeable people, knowledgeable people that we have on the on the podcast, just in terms of research and and just general industry uh, insight into trends and tactics specifically. Um, so it was super great having her on to, like I said, you know, in the intro, just to help people navigate what this quarantine will look like. And another reason why I generally like having her on is, you know, it gives me and you, Sam, the opportunity to 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 really uh, talk about what's going on in an in depth way. And you know, we got we got an opportunity to uh, not only discuss, you know, what artists are doing and and how people, including our listeners, can help, but you know, what the next step may be after this. What is the industry going to look like after this? What's going to stick, what's not, and sort of analyze the industry as a whole right now and kind of project the future. So um, I really enjoyed it. What'd you think? Yeah, I totally agree. If you ain't already, make sure you guys are live streaming. Uh, this is an incredible way to engage with your fans, live stream with other people, cross pollinate your audiences, Use this as an opportunity to spend more time thinking about content, thinking about growing your audience, and then also just stay dedicated to your craft. Uh, I think it might be a, a hard time in the music industry right now, but I think there's uh, when times of chaos lies opportunity. So it's up to y'all to go and get it. And on that note, we appreciate you every week for, excuse me, for tuning in. If you haven't already, please uh, hit us up on at Music Business Podcast, or feel free to leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate y'all greatly. Until next week. All right, guys. Wishing everybody good health. Peace.